Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining this Ethical Journalism Network event. Uh, I'm James Ball. I'm a trustee of the Ethical Journalism Network, and uh, I'm also your chair for this evening, uh, where we're talking about misinformation and the mainstream media. Um, I am joined by a very exciting panel. I'm really looking forward to chatting to both of them, but uh, anyone who has looked at the billing will know that we are down a panelist, very sadly, at very short notice. Um, Alyssa Richardson has uh, dropped out, um, but for very, very good reasons. Um, obviously, so, um, she, so she is, uh, there are protests growing in uh, Minneapolis uh, in the wake of uh, the killing of Dante Wright, and uh, people are cancelling their talks in solidarity with the demonstrations and also going there to uh, sort of mark witness and show solidarity um, and so of course we absolutely support her in doing that and uh, I really hope actually at some point you know we get another chance to have a conversation with her about some of the work she's done at just these sort of kind of events and, and monitored so We've lost a really interesting voice from the uh, the panel, but uh, for, for a you know a very very important cause. Um, but let me introduce the panelists that we do have. So we have Emily Bell, uh, who has possibly the longest title in academia, um, professor uh, professor of professional practice at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism. Um, you know, so uh, can't can't say. Can't say that in there. I'll I'll let that quickly. I've got, I've got huge business cards. A three like <laughs> business cards. Uh, and we've also got Brooke Binkowski, who is an absolutely veteran debunker and the managing editor of truthorfiction.com. Um, so welcome to you both. So um, Brooke, I might actually start with you first, if that's okay. Um, we tend to have this framing that maybe Donald Trump sort of helped us with of you've got news and fake news, you've got information and misinformation, it's all fairly straightforward. The news, you know, professional journalists tell you the proper news and nasty people on social media talk nonsense. So how, how's that? You know, is that how it works in practice? I'm sorry, let me make sure I understand the question. Uh, that There is a sort of popular... Um... Uh, conception that the press depended on Trump because it was so easy and I, the bad actor picked it up? No, that, um, that almost Donald Trump's kind of definition suited the press. You've either got news oh. over here and fake news over here yeah. and they're two different things and it's quite simple. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, this sort of simplistic, you know, bifurcated uh, binary viewpoint is, is part and parcel of authoritarianism, right? That's kind of just how how uh, that was our, our first clue when he was like, you're fake news. And then the smears started and things like that. I mean, this is sort of a classic textbook example of, of what you get when you have um, authoritarianism embedded in, um, in, in some kind of a public office. The first thing they go after, um, well, the first people they go after, the first groups they go after are, are out groups, but they always attack journalists among them um, because, you know, we're for obvious reasons, right? Like we're the ones who are saying, no, don't do that, that's wrong. Or well, not, we're not the ones saying that, we're saying this is what's going on here so that the public can say, no, don't do that, that's wrong. In terms of disinformation campaigns though, I've sort of thrown that old model out and now I'm going around just yelling at people because, you know, I mean, it, it seemed to me, first of all, it suits my personality. Second of all, it seems to be pretty effective actually. It's uh, definitely very satisfying. But yeah, that, that was definitely what Trump did. And, and it appeals to people with um, simplistic worldviews you know, whether or not, whether it's because they want the world to be simplistic or because they themselves, you know, just don't know any better, you know, if maybe they've lived isolated lives or whatever. It appeals to people like that. It appeals to fascists because fascists, you know, believe that everything should, can and should be simple. It, um, it appeals to people who hate the press for whatever reason. Um, and it appeals to people who want to be part of the press, but can't be, right? Like the ones who want to, they just, they're just, begging, just gagging to be in the mainstream media, but they can't hack it. And so instead they become part of this, you know, shadow press, right? Which, which would never fly in any other time. 
because they're terrible. <laughs> so now you have this sort of ecosystem of, of alternate media figures and pundits and whatever, and they're all just spewing disinformation. So yeah, I mean, he was part of this sort of larger ecosystem, this larger constellation of disinformation campaigns, but that worldview, it's simple and it sticks. And so how does the mainstream, you know, if we're talking, you know, from the New York Times to CNN to respectable outlets, do they do a good job in stopping misinformation reaching the public? Well, I mean, <laughs> well, there, there's a lot in that question. On, on one hand, I don't think so. On the other hand, it's not any fault of journalists or reporters. Um, I mean, we're, we're in the middle of this enormous disinformation campaign that's been going on for a very long time. I mean, this one, I believe, started in 2014 with Gamergate and all of that sort of like what flowed from Gamergate. Um, but I believe, ooh, ooh, I'm going to start sounding like a conspiracy theorist real fast here. Um, I think that this has been part of something that's been going on, sort of these these forces that have been in play, at least in the United States, for at least 40 years. And by that, I mean, you know, marketing campaigns, advertising, sort of the, these like coercive campaigns that we've had, um, as well as the increasingly, um, uh, I don't know, bullshit, I can't think of the right word, the increasingly, um, you know, uh, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on the word, bullshit, all right? That's, I, I, Bullshit's good. Okay. Uh, quick, quick uh, uh, explanation. I learned how to speak in England. I'm, I'm American. I was born here, but then my family took me to the to the UK. Um, so I grew up there, learned how to speak there. So I sort of code switch when I'm talking to people who are like, you know, uh, from anywhere in the UK because I, that's my original like way of speaking and thinking. So it's it's really interesting. It's like very tiny, sort of L1, L2 if you're a linguistics person thing. So I start saying things like pram and bullshit and I can't think of the Americanism or I can't think of any sort of other word for them. I have the same problem when I switch from English to Spanish because that was a late, late acquired language for me as well. Anyway, sorry. Um, so that sort of like form of, of politics has been much more confrontational. And um, so that's this sort of this, this encroaching confrontational politics in, in the United States. I, I know that we've already already been confrontational, but there's been this real nasty sort of like, well, you can explain it away if it's politics, you know, politics, it, it's just politics, like it's this increasingly poor behavior. So there's that. There's also been for, I don't know, since my career began 25 years ago, <laughs> ugh, um, in 1990, 26 years ago, shit, 1995, no. Well, anyway, a long time ago, right? Um, when my career began ages ago, <laughs> um, I came into a newsroom in uh, San Diego, a radio station, and there were about 25 people there. I've told this story a billion times, but it's such a really great illustration. And they said, oh my God, there used to be 50 people here all hours of the day and night round the clock. And now we don't get to cover anything. There's only 25 of us because of the layoffs. Okay, that was 95, whatever year. I'm sorry, my math sucks, but like whatever year that was, that's how long I've been in the news. Um, and then I went back uh, about four years ago to do an interview to the same station, same building, same everything. And they were interviewing me this time. And there were three people in the station. And one person was the board op running the board, one person was a guy on the air, and then the news director was there just supervising. And I said, where's the reporters? Where'd they go? And they said, there's no reporters here anymore. Like, it doesn't work that way anymore. It's all affiliated and syndicated content. And, you know, and so that's kind of where we're at now. Like there's the few reporters who do exist uh, anywhere on all levels, they're so overworked, they're exhausted. You know, there's the cynical sellouts on one hand, and then there's the the, real, the people who really, really, really want the world to be better. And there's a lot of those, the, the real earnest, like bleeding heart journalists who, who hate authority. Like there's some wonderful ones out there. But you know, after your fifth story of the day, you know, you're, you're turned into a content mill, basically you start to make mistakes. So it's a failure of, of years of culture, years of bad practices, years of layoffs, years of austerity, all of these things that set us up for this perfect storm of being completely unable to uh, culturally, sociologically, socially, you know, it, it, journalistically able to defend ourselves against this. In fact, I was just thinking the other day, like I have the benefit of institutional knowledge in journalism because I come from a journalism family. My whole family's journalist, which is why I don't have any money and I never will and nobody in my family ever will. <laughs> but I also have a lot of that, right? As at least three generations. That's what I know of, what I've been in contact with. That means I have that much institutional knowledge. Journalists, not all journalists, many journalists no longer have that because there's been such a break with the layoffs and the, the lives that have been destroyed of journalists, right? Like journalists don't know, many of the, my colleagues never know what to do after journalism. What do you do? Like what you, you go, go work in an office so you can tell everybody to <laughs> what you think of them <laughs> um you know work in, in i guess some some make the the jump to politics but 
there's only so many jobs in politics that you can do. And so anyway, my point is there's a lot of things we could have done a lot better. A lot of people, really good people tried. The culture of journalism in the United States is, is has been very um, much a bedfellows culture, a sort of insidery culture, which has now changed. That was part of it as well. There were a lot of things, but I think that most people did the best they could with what they had, even though I'm very angry about it. I'm trying really hard not to swear. Every time I hesitate, by the way, I'm trying not to say something. <laughs> I'll probably turn red too. Um, but I mean, I, I wish people would listen to me sooner, right? Like that's, that's my big contention. Like, why didn't you listen to those of us who are saying, no, this is bad. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. But I guess it was so unprecedented in our lifetimes that- I'm going to just wrap, wrap you there for the moment so I can bring in uh, Emily for a while, but- um, Oh, no problem. I know I tend to run on. I'm sorry, Emily. <laughs> don't worry at all. That's fine. So, um, Emily, you sort of, you are, you are sort of a, a teacher and a practitioner for a long time at sort of the edge of digital journalism and where journalism meets tech. And even there, a lot of people I speak to, and I suspect a lot of people you speak to, talk about where mainstream journalism goes wrong as usually journalists as victims, you know, it's hollowed out or the public don't trust us anymore as if that's some passive action. Uh, whereas misinformation is the result of just nasty social media, good information happens in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I, d I don't think that's your view, is it? Well, so, 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 so no, it's not. I mean, I'm, I'm really, really sorry that Alyssa is not here, not just because her voice is um, really important and at this, at this moment, um, and everybody should read her, her book, Witnessing uh, Wild Black, which if you are a journalist, uh, and particularly if you're interested in the ethical uh, dimensions of what we do at the moment, is an absolute must read. And some of what she says in her work is so relevant now, which is, when you think about things like misinformation or the, the representation of certain communities, there are large swathes of uh, people in America uh, and you can take certainly uh, black people, you can take other people of color, you can take people of certain religions, you can take women and say for a long time, mainstream media misrepresented and underrepresented all of those groups. So when we talk about misinformation, there is a, 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 first of all, sort of, you know, where are we coming from on it? And, and, and I think that, you know, there is a binary that has been set up uh, largely by, I think, technology company talking points that has some truth in it, uh, but which is really overly simplistic. So uh, the, the, the tech platforms would say, and in fact, if you go and read Nick Clegg's incredibly long medium post uh, defending Facebook uh, last week that he posted, you will see all of these <laughs> books in there, which start off with, this is not a new problem. Um, he's right about that, it's not a new problem. And the mainstream press has been really complicit in uh, forwarding narratives which are just not true or which just frame stories in the, in the wrong way. And explicitly in America in the past four years, you have one of the most powerful broadcasters, Fox News, which has a historically high levels of uh, audience coverage, putting forward things which are giving a nod to conspiracy theories, putting forward things which are not true, uh, smudging the line between facts, uh, not just smudging the line between fact and opinion, but framing things which are just opinion as fact. Uh, and really driving that um, relationship with Trump and his uh, super spreading of misinformation uh, as being a sort of core part of that strategy. So it's very easy to look at this and say, look, this is not social media's fault. This all existed in the mainstream press beforehand. That might be true. But you talk to anybody who's in Brooke's line of work, which is fact checking and thinking about where truth comes, if you like, in the media stack, and over and over again, people I've interviewed in that area, we did a lot of research into this at the Tower Centre, say in about 2012, things really went off the hook. You know, they started to absolutely explode. Why did they start to explode? The share button was added to Facebook on mobile devices. It can be something as simple as that. You know, we have designed into platforms these small uh product decisions which have fundamentally changed how people communicate with each other and how information, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech is shared 
and, and spread. <laughs> and, and we've designed those systems without any thought about the uh, guardrails that we put around them. So, so this idea of, did it exist beforehand and is the mainstream media complicit? Yes, absolutely. Is social media separate from this uh, or, or has it created this with, with, with its own horrible culture? Not entirely, but also it can't really be separated. I, I just don't think the two can be separated. And why I don't think the two can be separated is this, which is, you know, for the past, you know, pretty much kind of seven or eight years, we've done, all we've studied at the Tower Centre has been that intersection between uh, journalism and technology. Practices in newsrooms are absolutely altered by the presence of social media. Uh, Twitter has had such a profound effect on how people think about stories and gathering stories. And, the, and, and there are beneficial aspects to that as well. So in Alyssa's work, and I absolutely wouldn't speak for her, but I want to reference it. She says, you know, you think about the members of the black community, particularly in America, who've had to do the witnessing of violence and you know po po police killings of members of their community because there isn't any press you know there, there is nobody there who is who is um witnessing for them they put themselves uh, members of the community put themselves in in danger it's picked up by activists who've organized largely through social media um through uh, grassroots organizations and that has definitely changed the dynamics and it's changed the conversation inside a lot of newsrooms about how do we represent stories? How do we tell stories? Why is it that we show killing a killing of, 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 of a black man on loop on news, which we would never, ever show uh, the killing of a white person on the news in the, in the same way? We don't humanise one set of uh, the community um, but we do humanise the other set, you know, it's, it's, it's sparked all these really, I think, interesting conversations. So I, I don't like to think of it as being a binary of misinformation uh, has been entirely the fault of, 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 of Facebook. I think where I would hold technology to account and where they fail to hold themselves to account is saying, Anybody with a reasonable imagination, and Brooke is absolutely right, if you go back and look at Gamergate, anybody with a reasonable imagination could see that this was coming up the pipe, that anything you can imagine being used for good, and God knows we have enough speeches by Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey or uh, the founders of Google about the great benefits of connectivity and organizing information for the world. Social media caused the Arab Spring, of course. Ex exactly, you, flip, you can flip that and say, for, for every good use of it, you can find a malign use of it. And we know from economic markets, I also like to think about the real time monetary exchange that goes on uh, through the design of platforms. They are like real time trading systems in some ways. The economic laws say, if you don't have a regulated market, then bad money will always drive out good because ethical players will never do the things that unethical players will do. And eventually, you know, the, 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 the variant strain of bad behaviour overwhelms and drives out, out good. Right. And, and that is what we've got now, which is, you know, it doesn't matter. So, so, so as Brooke says, we've got a diminishing field of professional journalists at local level. And actually, that's not, I mean, it, it, it's partly to do, it, well, it's entirely to do with the recession of advertising, and that is entirely to do with the dominance of Facebook and Google. It's not necessarily their fault. It is just something which has happened in the progression of technology. And it's been aided to some extent by a rollback of regulation. So in the United States, I was talking to Congress the other day and sort of giving evidence on this and saying, if you look at the 40 year arc of, of regulation in the United States, it has just rolled back um, ownership, cross ownership, local. Uh, so what's happened is you, it, you know, Brooke's experience in her radio station is completely typical. And you have many markets now where players like Sinclair Broadcasting, another spreader of misinformation, has cropped up as a local broadcaster, doesn't have to have journalists in the areas that it's covering anymore because the FTC removed that obligation in 2017. And research shows that where you don't have uh, local coverage, and particularly when you look at something like Sinclair, what happens is the local coverage becomes more national. So in other words, there are fewer local stories, more national stories. 
and more political. Uh, so, so you have these various forces, I think, and it just is ripe, therefore, for the spread of bad actors, misinformation, kind of the, the, the sort of, and the politicization of just really the journalism yeah. commons. Sorry, I'm now going on too much. So um, well, no, I'm, no, I'm gonna, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm going to throw actually the next question also to you, because I, I then want to approach the same thing from a different angle with Brooke. But, you know, if, if I'm a company, you know, if I'm Unilever or I'm Kraft or I'm someone and I make stew and sell stew as ready meals and fewer people are buying stew. I keep seeing more people buying curries or more people are buying sort of salads or other products in the supermarket. And the people who are buying my stew, they keep saying that they like it much less than they used to and it doesn't appeal to them. Um, I don't sort of, you don't sort of see people trying to go, what we need now is for the public to come back to stew. We need, you know, we need to ban the curry. We need to sort of educate the public on why they should eat stew. Um, you start seeing them kind of go, well, if we don't want to throw out our product entirely, how do we change it? How do we make variants of it? What bits do we do this on? Uh, which is my very clumsy analogy for going, I think journalism often mixes up values with habits. And we sort of want to keep doing what we always used to do, which actually, as you set out, left behind a lot of people the whole time through, left out people of colour, left out women, left out LGBT people, um, left out in a lot of ways working class people. How much do you think, you know, where do we move as a profession so that we don't just start always pointing at everyone else, you know, the bit of it we can fix, we should call, you know, we can look for more tech accountability, we can report on tech, but what do we do to start fixing our bit of the, the problem, you know, the bit that we're actually in charge of and that know how to do? That was at you, Emily. Oh, that's at me, right, okay. Um, well, so I'm just gonna push back a tiny bit on this, which is to say, the part of the narrative that nobody should, I, I completely think that complacency and the failure of uh, mainstream media does need to be acknowledged and examined. I don't think that it's fair to say that all of journalism has not been adaptive. I am absolutely amazed at the adapt at, at the adaptiveness and at the willingness to change of some parts of the news. I mean, Brooke is actually kind of a classic example of that. I'm going to do something which didn't exist, uh, you know, sort of 15 years ago. That's um, my specialty. Things we, that didn't exist. <laughs> And I, do, and I do think, you know, anyone who's had to sit through some of those very boring lectures about why didn't Kodak survive the digitized camera revolution? I look at journalism and I think, look at the, all of these amazing uh, units. You know, you, you run one yourself, James, that wouldn't have existed, that do things differently. Look at the investigative reporting networks that we have in places like the, uh, the ICIJ network. Uh, if you look at organizations like ProPublica in the US, which everybody laughed at in 2006. So this is a bizarre nonprofit vanity project, it's never gonna make any, any, any difference. I got a note today um, into my inbox from something called the Marshall Project, which is doing great reporting on uh, the criminal justice system in the United States saying, we're really examining the language that we use for uh, imprisoned people and, inmate is a stigmatized word you know we're going to stop using these we've produced a new style guide to do this so i think there's a faction and quite a sizable faction of journalists who are really innovative in the ways that they should be and every single newsroom successful unsuccessful big small digital analog everywhere i know that is having these conversations about how do we change not just technologically, but actually culturally. How do we make how do we make ourselves more relevant? You know, that's that said, um, I, I, I think that you know reinvention has its limits, and what we really need are reporters. We need yes. stories reporting. We need people to be good reporters. We are really short of them in all kinds of areas. 
And when you start to look at what happens when reporting goes away, you can see that in America now, and you can see what is filling the gaps. The big research project we're doing at the moment, the Tower Center, looks at the invasive influence now of shadowy, dark money. And the second book everybody should read is Anne Nelson's Shadow Network, which is the roots of the far right uh, and its entanglement with media in the United States, which will really shows you how Christian talk radio developed ultimately into Fox, <laughs> into Fox News uh, and, and how political influence and money in that system is changing. And we saw it uh, in the 2016 election with Breitbart funded heavily by the Mercers who were uh, enormous Republican donors. You know, we see it in the political alignments of Rupert Murdoch or we see uh, and now we're seeing it at local level and we're seeing it in these networks because there isn't going to be political campaigning in the way that we used to think of it. There isn't going to be a moment when everyone says, oh, you know, it's three months to the midterm, so should, we should put up some uh, bus side advertisements and we should buy some cable advertising. These are going to be issues and talking points which are drip fed into people's feeds by news organize news organizations not really news organizations which have political money behind them and you can't counter that unless you have a volume of good faith professional uh constant reporting and a network actually of unprofessionalized uh aware activists and people on the ground uh, or community builders who are really bought into this idea of having high quality information in their communities. And that's the thing that has completely broken at the moment. And we see it in the States and I can see it in Europe as well. I can see it in the UK too. You're lucky in that you have much more investment in public media in the UK. Um, but that entirely depends again on sort of implementation and willingness to really invest in reporting. So um, Brooke, I, I want to ask you about something that um, sort of, misinformation researchers sort of call the amplification funnel, um, but I think can be a bit more complicated. And I want to jump off what you were saying about how things almost grew up out of Gamergate and 4chan and 8chan a long while ago. And the example I always think of is 2016, where Russia and WikiLeaks hacked material and then published it at strategically very useful times for the Trump campaign. Whenever anybody says 2016, I just reflexively get tired. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, no, it's okay. I think it happens to everybody. <laughs> what happened with a lot of this, it wasn't necessarily false information, but actually the stuff in the document, broadly speaking, wasn't very interesting. But it did things like get the New York Times, CNN, major outlets having Hillary Clinton and emails near each other, but also helped fuel in large sort of sets of the right, what became first Pizzagate and then QAnon through, oops, <laughs> always good to set off your watch, um, fueled those through dodgy information about them that then came from a real leak that was in the media. And so that interaction, I think most people heard about the emails or the other one. I think people heard sort of through the mainstream media we don't seem to have much defense system against being played in that way, do we? No, because that defense system is, is journalism and academia and um, artists, musicians, public creatives, public intellectuals. Those are the people who fight against disinformation campaigns and fascism. I realize, you know, whenever I start going off like this, because I'm a big fan of, you know, artists and musicians and, you know, as well as journal and writers and so on. Um, because they, uh, like the creative class, um, is, is usually the first bulwark against disinformation and propaganda. Even if they're not doing one-to-one um, -one debunkings, they are creating stories, creating truths, right? Um, one of my friends, and I, this keeps recurring to me ever since he said it, it keeps recurring to me so much. I know at some point I'm going to be convinced it was my idea, so I need to apologize to him now, but he said the other day, um, because we were talking about disinformation and and what this has fundamentally done to us as a society, as a global society, as well as a, as a, as a nas national country, you know, our, our culture, national identity. Boy, what is my problem? Anyway, he said that stories, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and each other 
um, are the programming language of humanity, right? So if you change the stories, if you corrupt the stories, you corrupt us. You, we corrupt ourselves and each other. And we, if we tell stories about who we want our heroes to be and who our heroes are and what we want them to do, as well as our villains, um, that is our own sort of cultural pathway out of, you know, not disinformation campaigns, but bad people trying to do bad things. And those are important. Those, again, that's, that's a cultural model. Those are cultural models for ways we interact with everyday, the everyday world at large. And then when you change those, when you corrupt those, you see what happens when those become corrupted. And um, it's bad, man. It is way worse than I ever thought it could be. I think, um, well, so first of all, the New York Times would have, I, I think that they would have done much better had they had more dedicated reporters on that beat. I mean, my, my answer to everything is always going to be like more reporters for everything because it's a major problem. And that I loved what you said, Emily, because I'm like, yeah, more reporters. And I also think the reporters need to be treated better um, because it's really easy to burn out when you don't have enough money to buy food. Um, like that has, I mean, that's not just my situation. Uh, I mean, that's not my situation now, but it has been in the past. Uh, it's the situation of a lot of reporters I know. I mean, it's, it's a traditionally low paid uh, uh, industry anyway, but it's not just low paid anymore. It's like subsistence wages. It's, it's $10 an hour uh, at a time that minimum wage locally is, you know, $11 an hour. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's bad. And um, so it's, we have to, we have to understand, or we have to make, I don't know, society at large understand that, you know, just because we're journalists and we're used to not making a lot of money doesn't mean that we, you know, and we don't really complain a lot when it comes to like personal stuff, because we're so used to complaining about the system that we're starving, you know? So I, I mean, like, it, it comes down to small things like that, like feeding journalists, to, like give, paying them enough money to be able to feed themselves. So yeah, there was a, a really big screw up. I mean, the, the way everything was covered from 2015 through, uh, I mean, it's still happening. And, and I don't, like, I, I realize it sounds contradictory. I say this all the time. I realize the things that I say sound contradictory, but they're really actually part of a consistent worldview because I, I believe that the problem is not with journalists, but with journalism. And journalism is, is very, in very poor shape. So I think that all of these things that are symptomatic of journalism being in, you know, suffering badly. So if there had been more trained reporters, if there had been more reporters on that on those beats, if we had not been in the practice of telling ourselves, telling ourselves the story that we're too smart to fall for fake news, that we're too smart to fall, fall for disinformation campaigns, we're too reasonable, too rot logical, and much too rational, especially we're Americans. We're rational people, right? Truth, justice, the American way. I mean, obviously that was total BS, but uh, the, that was the story that we all told ourselves as a nation that we, you know, we're, we're doing everything for the greater good and we're too smart to fall for disinformation campaigns. And that was how we knew, we as Americans, and I'm speaking for my whole country here, whatever. Uh, we knew that we couldn't be subjected to disinfo campaigns because we couldn't fall for them anyway, so it wouldn't matter. So, so what if there were just some fake stories, you know, like there's just fake news, don't read it. It was like that, right? And that was the failure. It was the, the failure was in the stories that we told ourselves as a society and the failure was in journalism, not journalists, uh, in, in lack of journalism, looking at the things that they needed to look at. It was also really difficult in a, I realize this is a faint defense now, knowing what we know now, but it was very difficult to see past the fire hosing. Um, it's still difficult to, to remember a lot about the, the stories that we covered, the things that we did, the things we heard, the things that we saw. Um, because it's, it's just, you know, it's, there's just too much and, um, it's, it's really difficult to, to index it or to search for it because there's just too much information out there now. Um, so it worked, right. It was, it was another weapon that worked against us. So we were unprepared. Some of that was our fault. Some of it was cultural. Some of it was economic, well, economic austerity. Um, and some of it was just, um, um, um the fire hosing and some of it was just a massive just failure so, um, on our part. American arrogance, right? Like we, we're Americans. We don't fall for that kind of stuff. I quite, I just quite like the, uh, some of it was just a mess. That's a, that's a uh, lovely answer. Um, I've got plenty more questions and I'll come to some of them, but we've got some good questions from the audience. And one of them is a challenge to your last answer. So I, I want to ask that one now. Um, it's from Kevin Benz and he's, um, he's asked uh, more reporters isn't going to happen realistically how can reporters working on the street every day fight what reporters? <laughs> how do you recognize it how do you describe it and how do you report it without amplifying it 
Well, you can't report it without it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Emily. I just finished. Uh, no, no, no. So, sorry, Brooke. It's like, you know, your re reaction to 2016, I get exactly the same when I hear the <laughs> amplification. So yep. there, there, is, there, is, there, is, there is something else which I just want to say here, which is will make me very unpopular with some uh, people I respect, uh, that an awful lot is talked about the amplification of, you know, how, how, how the press has amplified amplification. Please define amplification. What do you mean? Do you mean when things are shared, when somebody writes something, when so, you know, I, and, 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 and where is that coming from? I mean, there are, I've had an earnest disagreement with, again, somebody I really respect in this area who said that um, the mainstream media, or particularly, you know, we, we were discussing one particular piece in a, what I would say, a responsible publication about QAnon, which was written at great length. Um, their view was this should not have been written. It's shining a light on something that we are amplifying. I think it's really important that when you have psychological flaws in a nation like America, that you examine them uh, carefully and in, and in public. And this idea of, well, how do we stop amplifying? Um, if you looked at the, I think, YouGov economist poll post uh, the uh, 2020 election, what was interesting to me was that Democrats knew much more about QAnon and thought much less of it. In other words, they had a low opinion of it, but a higher knowledge of it than Republicans. If you go through the Fox News archives, not Fox News doesn't cover QAnon very much. You know, the, the, the whole sort of like, let's focus on child trafficking or hashtag save the children. There are lots of people who are on the fringes of that movement who don't actually know anything about it. And the people who are reading longer detailed articles about where these people come from, what their beliefs are, how their belief systems uh, come about. I, I, I know what the criticism of amplification is, which is, you know, uh, you're putting you're putting the, the 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 spotlight on the wrong things. We've had it in the last couple of days over this change, you know, Johnson Johnson vaccine, and before on AstraZeneca. I've seen lots of journalists who I completely, you know, respect their professional standards in the past couple of days saying we shouldn't be reporting on this, or it's really irresponsible not to mention that you're more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to die of a blood clot. And it's like, that first of all, that's a false comparison. Secondly, nobody is saying that vaccines are not in general safe. Thirdly, as journalists- uh -huh. There's some people. <laughs> We should, well, yeah, sure. But you know, thirdly, as journalists, we should be asking questions about how is the safety procedure working? Why are these reviews? But you know, we shouldn't feel that none of this is where well, we do have a problem, I think, is so, so this idea of um more journalists is that more reporters are not going to happen. I'm never going to give up on that because I think you know we have focused so much on technical innovation as being the savior of journalism, and it just isn't. Uh we haven't thought about human innovation quite so much. And I think bringing those two things together is, is really you know, the, 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 the job of the next kind of five to 10 years. As Brooke said, paying people proper salaries, paying for their healthcare in America, that's innovation that we haven't actually focused on. We've been focused on the market will fix this problem and it will fix this problem if we just get the technology right. Um, I think that you know we could completely remake the field. We could do what Europe did in the 50s and put large amounts of money into projects and public infrastructure that actually address some of this. Uh, I think that the Biden administration is much closer to doing that than any administration since the Second World War. So I wouldn't give up on it completely. And I think that to some extent sort of being, we, we can't afford despair in, in, in this. And I think we have, to have, we have to have some faith that we can make journalism better uh, and that it's not just giving up to the fact that everything will come from public relations right. officers or politicians or, or, or misinformers. We cannot be, we have to be fighting for a different version of the future, I think. I, I really want to make an important point that I think that is not made enough um, about journalism. And this is everywhere, right? So there's this, uh, there seems to be this idea that, that journalism is in decline because of something that journalism did, or like that's just sort of the natural state of things. It's coming to the end of, you know, it's, it's reign in, as an information, you know, uh, source or whatever. 
no, journalism isn't dying. This is not a natural progression. Journalism is being killed by bad people who have an agenda. This is deliberate. It is very well documented. This is, this is not just a conspiracy theory of mine. This is something that people who are doing it, such as the Cokes, the Mercers, the Tanton Network, which I talk about at length, they have stated like in their plans um, that they, they wish to either uh, uh, obliterate media that you know drowns out their messaging, which is uh, filled with disinformation and lies, or they want to take it over. They want to co-op. It. And we see that happening with the Mercers and the Cokes in particular. The Tanton Network is a little bit different because they are very good at um, bombing onto messaging that already exists. But um, as far as the medium itself, uh, there's a, a huge takeover attempt that's been going on for a long time. And this isn't new. Oh, I get to bring up my this, this book I just read. So I just finished this book, which is a very bracing book. It was called Hitler in Los Angeles. And it's all about uh, a Nazi, an attempt to make Los Angeles this sort of... Um, Nazi, you know, powerhouse in the 1930s, 1940s. The reason they wanted Los Angeles was geographically, it was thought to be like a good place that it was between, you know, Tokyo and Berlin. Um, and that way Hitler could have his American bunker there. And there was a, a large uh, amount of American support for, for Hitler and Nazis in the 30s into the 40s, as a matter of fact, there were silver shirts and so forth. Uh, but the really important thing here is that they wanted to be in Los Angeles because they wanted to be in Hollywood because they recognized, they being Nazis, recognized the propagandistic value of the movie industry of Hollywood in, an, in totality um, as, as a propaganda you know, purveyor. And it's not as if white supremacists, eugenicists, Nazis, and you know, assorted other scumbags haven't known the power of media all along. Um, so that's that's why I really want to challenge that because uh, why isn't there any money in journalism? Oh yeah, because of internet advertising. Where's that money going? Oh yeah, it's going to the tech companies that are directly uh, the ones who are controlling internet advertising and they're mislaying money. In 2019 alone, the news industry globally lost $3 billion to keywords that were mismatched. That's it. Uh, I read this in Branded, <laughs> which is a very good newsletter about the advertising industry. And it's like kind of the extent of my knowledge about marketing. I mean, I, obviously I corroborate it because I'm a fact checker, that's what I do. But um, yeah, I mean, this is like, this is a deliberate sustained effort uh, to get rid of people like, like me. Um, they, I've also been personally, and I know a lot of other people have been at the uh, bad end of the smear campaign, which is what they do uh, for the more, um, I don't know, confrontational journalists, the ones who go after liars and tell them they're, they're liars. Uh, they have this whole disinformation network that they use to smear and try to intimidate reporters, particularly reporters of color, particularly women reporters of color. They try to get them killed. They try to stain their name and their work and threaten their credibility and so forth. Um, so, I, I mean, all of this has been deliberate. It's been done to us. I'm not trying to let journalism off the hook at all. I mean, I, I know very well uh, what our weak points are. I know very well like what our flaws are as Americans, as media people, as, as all of these things. But I also want to say that there has definitely, undoubtedly, indubitably been a sustained effort to, to corrupt uh, journalism in the United States and in other countries such as Canada. Uh, Mexico, they just, um, they, they've tried that as well. Um, I worked in Mex Mexico a lot. Uh, they just kind of started killing my colleagues, you know, um, after a while. Um, and I know that it's happening throughout Europe, Western Europe in particular, sorry, Eastern Europe in particular, of course, and, uh, and in the UK. I don't so know what, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna, to say. I'm gonna jump in with questions here. It's, um, just cause we've got quite a lot and they're all good. Um, so this is slightly on the resource issue too. Um, and I've worked as a fact checker and one of the sort of killer things is the asymmetry of it. It takes two minutes to make something up and sometimes hours to do a debunk, especially if it's a crazy one. So I've got a question from Hung Nguyen uh, who asks um, about the, the sort of ability for AI to potentially create misinformation quickly. Oh, yes, to harder. create it. it yes. To create it, not to, not yes. to solve it, to create it and it quite sophisticated stuff that would be even harder to debunk. You know, if we're fighting an asymmetrical war already, could it make it harder? And 
what do we do to fix that? Could we not just, you know, it's the only way to stop a bad AI with a gun, a good AI with a gun. The same old bullshit's <laughs> been working for the past 50 years. They don't need to make up any new rumors because it's just all recycled Bircher crap. Sorry, I said, I'm trying not to that's swear. Fine, I'm so that's sorry. Fine, don't worry. It's just been, <laughs> now I've broken the seal. Oh no. Um, it's but, after it, the watershed it, in the UK. So uh, you're not <laughs> here, but sorry to my, American uh, listeners. Um, the uh, thing that I say a lot, and I'm, it's painting with a broad brush and I recognize that, but it is true more often than not, okay? So it's like one of my rules of thumb, which means there's always something to argue with, but yeah. Um, I, I often say that the disinformation is in place uh, not to give, to persuade people, but to give them permission. They believe it because they want to believe it, not because they do believe it. Like they are thinking of, ways they can justify the things that they are being told, the people who really buy it. Um, there are, again, exceptions. You can point to any of them, but by and large, look at the people at the Capitol. You think they were led there all unknowing? You think they didn't go there with, you know, a plan in mind to burn the place down figuratively and literally? I mean, they knew what they were doing. So I, I don't want to like, I don't want to let anybody off the hook or anything like that. But yeah, it's, it's, not persuasion, it's permission. So you can say whatever you want. You could go out and say the sky is green and somebody would be like, oh, it's the, it's the Jews yeah. or whatever. I think that's a, I, I think that's a really important point when we think about AI. So, the, so, so you know, we look, again, we look at this a lot and you look at the promise of AI for mass moderation of social media platforms. So I think Mark Zuckerberg does genuinely believe that AI will solve 95% of their moderation problems in time. I think anyone who's a politician or a linguist or a journalist thinks that it is extra or even a data scientist who <laughs> looks at equity issues thinks that that is a really very over, overly optimistic um, estimate. And I, I, I think that the ability to create, so if you look at something like GPT-3, you know, just sort of scripting, scripting, um, scripting technologies that already exist. I mean, you know, this network that we're looking at at the moment, which is uh, what we call the Pink Slime Network of local news outlets in the US, which is about 1500 different titles. Uh, they're funded by political money. Their funding is obscure. In other words, you can't quite tell who's behind it. They wash narratives through their automated pages around things like voter fraud. Uh, we're beginning to see uh, stories around trans rights, which is another big wedge issue for the right here at the moment in, um, in, the, in the UK. And they use templated, it's not even AI, it's just templated scripting, sort of straightforward automated stories. And they produce about a million in the course of a million, over a million of these stories in the course of 2020 in the in the, the election cycle. Now they don't necessarily land; they don't have the same impact. Um, but it comes back to this this point that um, Brooke was making about stories and the cre and creativity, and also it's also the case that you can have as much technology producing misinformation as you like. It has to have fertile ground to land on. You know, there's plenty of studies that say that actually misinformation only works in certain circumstances. It works where you have social division, it works where you have inequality, it works where you have great asymmetries in access to information, and it really exists where you have strongly held beliefs, beliefs which are, there's some really interesting work by scholars uh, in looking at how um, particularly religious people, for instance, in the fundamentali fundamentalist Christians in the US read uh, texts of the Bible in the same way that Brooke would fact check a, an article and genuinely believe that they have understood and that they, they, they hold the truth of the text, even though somebody who was not a fundamentalist Christian might read it and say that this is completely not true. So, so you have, I think we, it's not something where technology is definitely sort of making it worse because we're releasing these things without really deciding whether or not we should. So that's the big problem with AI at the moment, which is that unlike uh, biotechnology, where you actually tend to have ethics councils and you tend to um, have some kind of regulatory hurdle that you have to cross before they're released, 
if Facebook makes a change uh, to its product set or if you have a new creative AI on the market, um, those things are just let loose. Nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody says is it a good idea to do this. There's no kind of multi-set. It doesn't go to Congress. Nobody says it, it doesn't go to the FT, uh, FCC. Nobody kind of rubber stamps it and says, we've thought about all the use cases for this and we've decided it's fine to do it. Um, I, I think that's probably going to have to change, uh, and I think it will probably change in relation to um, uh, misinformation. Unfortunately, I don't think it will be damage to sit or harm to citizens that, change that changes that. It will probably be things like threat to markets. So when you see things like uh, the subreddit, the Wall Street subreddits that can massively inflate the value of GameStop over three weeks, something like that is much more likely to actually prompt some kind of review of how platforms are moderated or what kind of speech is moderated or what kind of technologies we, we allow into this arena. But, you know, my, my worry, not, it's not my worry, but I think the truth is that we're just at the beginning of understanding some of these problems. And, you know, this is a very long journey. We are not in any way uh, across um, the problems here. And we have people who are actually making decisions about these products right now who don't fully understand the dimensions of what they are producing and creating and putting out there. And I think we have to start looking at this model of harm and potential harm, which actually the European Union has been much better at adopting as a way to think about how we allow platforms to grow uh, and how we think about the mechanisms that we um, deploy. So, so I think I'm, I'm it's, gonna... it's a problem, but I think, you know, I th think it's kind of, you know, I don't think it's the only problem. I'm going to jump in here. <laughs> I've got a couple of uh, questions on sort of possible fixes or solutions for journalism, but I want to try and get through them. Uh, we've got to try and keep to around an hour, but I'm going to push a couple of minutes past to get these ones out. The first one is what I feel ethically obliged to ask, um, because as Emily hinted, um, I, in my day job, I run reporting teams for a grant funded journalism not for profit. Um, and I have a question from Jill R saying, um, there are jobs being created for journalists via grants and philanthropy, but often these are focused on campaign journalism. Does campaign journalism on balance help correct some of the disinformation being spread, or does it in its own ways contribute to misinformation, given its incentive to report on things in a way that will further a particular area of policy and its tendency to resonate in already polarized echo chambers? When I'm sorry, when uh, you say campaign journalism, do you mean covering um, campaigns for office, like runs for office, or do you mean campaign journalism as in beats? I mean, I, I suspect beats, if, if it's thinking about organizations like my organization, we cover environment, healthcare, big tech, um, okay, you know, so we have specialist beats, Marshall Project, yeah. of course, US criminal justice. Yeah, issue based beats. Uh, the questioner has clarified as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and by the way, if, sorry, if you hear any weird noises in the background, my dog is, it's about time for her to get fed. So she starts making very strange noises. So I apologize because I've been watching her and she's kind of getting, <laughs> um, it's not me, is what I'm saying. Um, can I, I'm sorry, Emily, did you, did I launch into it? No, 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 go ahead. Okay, okay, um, cool. Because this is, this is something that I think about quite a lot, actually. Um, so um, if it had been campaign-based journalism as in political campaigns, I would have said, absolutely, it introduces uh, misinformation and disinformation in as people try to cozy up to whatever politicians they're covering. And, you know, it depends on what their motivations are for covering said politicians or runs for office or whatever. That's something totally different. But beat journalism, um, I'm a big proponent of that because you have to really know a topic well to be able to adequately cover it. I think it fights misinformation and disinformation. Um, I mean, obviously don't take any one person's word for anything, like check what they say against what other experts are saying and so on and look at their journalism and be critical of it. But it, in the end, uh, beat journalism is very good. It's, it, I believe that you, well, you can be a general in interest reporter and also have a specific area of interest and expertise. It's possible to develop others um, along the way and you can always just be a general assignment reporter. You don't ever have to lock yourself in, you know, for, for your lifetime. Um, but it also offers a strong and very solid foundation of who to talk to, what books to read, what books you've already read, uh, what you've watched, like who you've encountered, your area of study, um, knowing something 
as well as any expert and reporting on it is always a good thing, always. Um, especially when you know the critiques and, and the, the, the flaws and, and so on. So, um, and it can help you in ways, and this is, I'm gonna try to keep this very short, but it can help you in ways that you may not realize at the time. So I've developed over the years, I'm, I'm from San Diego, uh, which is a border community, a border county in uh, Southern California, right? We're right up against Tijuana um, in Mexico. And because of this, the entire region is, is very aware of immigration issues because the border's right here, um, but not everybody. It's very racially and uh, linguistically segregated. And so I, as, um, somebody who is a oh, white presenting, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm very confused about like my own ethnic identity now because there's been so much, the United States is like this total, it's, it's gnarly right now when it comes to personal identity, but as a white person, white-ish person um, in San Diego, an Anglo white person, I was exposed to a certain story about what the border was. And it's like masses of people, those people, those people, you know, it's always those people coming from the South. And they're just like clawing over each other to get in. And I was like, oh, you know, growing up, I was like, oh, that's weird. You know, why would they want to come here? Like, whatever. Because I had a strange relationship with the United States anyway, because I come from the UK and was born, you know, whatever. Um, so I then started to just like one way or another, my life took me to various places. And I realized that, uh, you know, I just started questioning everything in early adulthood, right? Because that's what you do. And I realized that everything I knew about the border was wrong. Um, and it was just stuff I'd picked up. It was like all cultural. And I wanted to know why. Um, I didn't figure out exactly why I was hearing the things that I was hearing for many years, but that's another story. So when these disinformation campaigns started to hit um, in 20, like the most recent ones in 2016 about the border and so on, by then I'd been a border reporter for many years because I took it upon myself as somebody who realized that I didn't know anybody who knew anything about the border except for people who were Latino, who had come from Mexico and lived in the United States or whose family had come from Mexico. And I was like, why? This, this is the border, it's right here. It's an international border. It's the gateway to Latin America. Like there's, there are important things happening here. And why is it that everybody pretends it doesn't exist? It is what I came around to thinking. So I started studying it and learning about it, covering it, developed out this beat. I worked at, on this beat for 10 years. Oh God, sorry, my dog. Um, and I um, became very, it became very clear over time that the reason I thought the things that I did about the border, not just me, obviously, like Southern California was because of a disinformation campaign that had been attached to Southern California about the border for a very long time from people who had a different ax to grind. They were eugenicists. They were um, people who thought that the country was overpopulated, like legitimately openly eugenicists that rebranded in the 70s. Um, so um, because of all of this, because of my fami familiarity with all of this, I also knew what the disinformation was specifically. So when I started to see it in 2016 associated with a Trump campaign, not only was I able to recognize it for what it was and be able to really debunk border stories very quickly, um, I could also uh, tell you exactly where it came from, who wrote it, <laughs> like who wrote that, that particular piece of, of disinformation, what they really wanted and who was working within the Trump administration uh, because of it. So it, it's very helpful in many ways. I actually um, counsel people who are thinking about uh, young people or returning students who are thinking about uh, getting a degree in journalism because they want to be journalists. I always advise them to find something they really love other than journalism and minor in that so that they can have a working academic structural knowledge of something else so that they can specialize in you know, uh, a beat or if they don't want to develop a beat and get out of journalism, they can do something else entirely. <laughs> um, I'm, I've got to jump in um, with a final question towards Emily and you can also use that to, um, if you want to weigh in anything on the last one too. I'm just quite aware Brooke's dog needs feeding and we've also hit our hour. But, uh, <laughs> It's a really interesting I question. Also, I, I was also just saying goodbye to a very dear friend who has been in America for tw uh, eight years and is just going back to London. Who was, was like, Oh my word! Oh. <laughs> it's, like, it's very dramatic. It's very yeah. dramatic. Wow! <laughs> All um, the events. Um, but um, but yes, last question from Jeanette Alter, which is: um, Is there a historical pres precedent of rebuilding journalism in America that could apply today? Um, so Emily. But so yes, uh, and and just on the on the just on the grant funding um, point, which I think is an important one. Um, every single business model 
or journalism ha is attached to certain problems and we have to learn how to navigate those problems and we learned in advertising advertising funded, funded uh, journalism to you know you could say exactly the same thing about was ad advertising funded journalism actually contributing to misinformation if you think about fashion magazines funded by the beauty industry. Is those misinformation? I think we have to get away from trying to label absolutely everything as misinformation. That's the first thing I would do. I would be very happy if we never wrote any stories ever again about misinformation and started talking about the actual root causes. But I think that this idea of philanthropy supporting journalism means that we have to negotiate some kind of new disclosure deals as well with uh, the public and to, as, as Brooke says, knowing exactly who is funded by who and why they are saying what will actually become really important to journalists, as will disclosure. I think we're just doing a piece of research, research which hasn't been released yet on Google and Facebook funding journalism. They are the two largest independent funders of journalist in, journalism in a philanthropy uh, lens in the world, including this uh, latest deal in Australia, which really gives substantial amounts of money to newsrooms these sums of money are not disclosed, those relationships with actually kind of quite powerful companies are often not disclosed. We have to sort of renegotiate all of that. Sorry, now. I will, can I very quickly just put, yeah. put in my disclaimer of TBIJ discloses all of its funders and on individual stories discloses yeah. which grant yeah. makers contributed to that story we as well to, we have to build it we have to build a practice around that i think and you know hats off to the tbij and it's something we try and do as well which is just make sure that you disclose all your funding have a have a have a framework for that can we learn lessons from american uh, reform in the past i mean it's interesting to me that we're going through a kind of a cycle at the moment which is not unlike the cycle of 150 years ago where you had most of the American press was part partisan, hyper-partisan was actually there to serve political causes uh, and yellow journalism as you know Joseph Pulitzer, I work at a school that was founded because Joseph Pulitzer uh, thought that journalism needed professionalizing um, and then we professionalized and the model, the business model that supported us was advertising for about 100 years and now that's going away and we have to rethink how we professionalize and we have to rethink some of our standards and ethic, ethics and how we interpret those into this new environment that we're working in. Um, and, and so I, but I do think that we can learn from the fact that, you know, nothing's, I, I work with historians, there's a great historian called Richard John here who has written something called Network Nation, which again, sorry to add to your reading list, is a really fantastic history of communications technology in the United States. And Richard sort of annoys me, but is also one of the people I admire most who I work with, who always says, this is nothing new. Go back and look what, look what was happening you know the post office and the Brit and, 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 the, and the British in the 18th century. You know that that, that actually the post office act of 1792 was about securing um, privacy. Uh, it was about securing um, exchange of information, uh, and it was about securing uh, the wheels of uh, commerce. And it was done very much in relation to sort of you know it was, it was like a platform. It was like a platform reform bill. And we have to, we can always go back to those things and think about how did we reform journalism? How did we professionalize it? How did we create standards around advertising? How did we create standards around technology? How do we create standards around platforms? I think it's just a lot at the moment. My real worry is that we are a diminished field. There is no two ways about it. If you look at the growth in public relations, if you look at the growth in political operatives, if you look at the growth in a uh, platform, um, if you look at the, cr the creator economy, which is basically kind of PR or advertising in a slightly different format, mm -hmm. the number of people in journalism is really kind of very small. And, and the control of how we reach people is totally changed. So, you know, we don't have a gatekeeping, um, we don't have a gatekeeping function anymore, that has gone. And we have to renegotiate that entire world in a very, very different framework to the one that we've been operating in for the past 100 years. But I don't think it's impossible because, as Brooke said, you know, if you don't have, you know what happens when you don't have the imperative for an independent, at least an independently minded body of people who are there to create a public record, who are there to hold power to account, and are there to tell people stories or help them tell their stories 
in a powerful and impactful way. Uh, and journalism really works. I mean, this is the other thing, journalism works. Some of the conversations we're having at the moment are we're only having because journalists or independent researchers have done the work, uh, often in incredibly adverse conditions. There is a reason why there are so many journalists in jail. There is a reason why so many governments are passing anti-journalistic, anti-freedom of the press uh, bills right now, because journalism works you know, at, at one level. We, we shouldn't let go of that either. I feel like that's an incredibly optimistic note to end on. Um, I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, I hope everyone watching has too. And thank you for bearing with us through some uh, teething troubles and difficulties there. Uh, your panellists have been uh, Emily Bell and Brooke Bigowski. Please do follow and track them both. And this has been an event from the Ethical Journalism Network. Um, we have a shiny new website designed just this week and launched this week. So please do take a look at that. Um, do feel free to make any donations if you're able and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and thank you very much for joining us this evening.